Hi everybody and welcome to the Endless Hells podcast. Hope you're all well who's watching along. I'm joined tonight by Anthony. How are you, Anthony? Very well, Stephen. It's uh, last day uh, on the job today, so my out of office is on. Two weeks summer holidays has begun and in dual fashion, it started pissing down outside. But hey, <laughs> it's all sunny at, thing, all at Celtic Park, so here, cheers, here we go. 100% the heat we have certainly fucked off when you came off work anyway and then we have our guest <laughs> from the Celtic blog James P. Forrest how are you buddy? I'm alright mate thanks for having me back on cheers no worries man it's good to have you back on and obviously apologies for some technical issues there but hopefully fingers crossed they're all sorted but first of all before we get stuck in I want to kind of draw your attention to a long term listener of ours Paul McFarland who got in touch with the show just to let us all know that he's took himself off Facebook and social media and he doesn't. It, it, he wants to make it clear that he's not ignoring anybody. He's just going through a numbness at the moment, and he's trying to battle that and recover. Needless to say, everyone here at Dennis House Podcast is behind him 100. percent And we wish him well and a speedy recovery. I'm an be watching as well. So, hurt, come along, Paul. Brilliant man. And thanks Absolutely. for getting the touch. Well, we're all thinking of you, and um, well, you're uh, ready to join us back on. Um, you know, we'll always be happy to hear from you. Yeah, 100%. And we can see it at the bottom of the screen here, Anthony James Forrest seems to be having some technical issues at the minute. So I'll just take him away from the chat as it goes. Hopefully he gets that sorted. But we'll move into the game against Lego Warsaw. Anthony, it was a kind of a, do you know what I mean? It was like, I don't know, friendly pre-season, testimonial, a big thank you match to for boards. But before I obviously get into the game and the overall score and things, just to touch upon the fellow himself, Arthur Boric, what a guy. What a player, what a figure for Celtic Football Club and the clubs he's represented. Yep, you're absolutely bang on. Um, probably the first, well, perhaps even an absolute world class um, is the only way to describe Arthur Boric at his peak at Celtic. Um, there was a, a time, probably around um, Euro 2008, perhaps even World Cup 06 as well. He, he was up there with the best in the business for me. Um, greatest goalkeeper I've ever seen at Celtic. And to be fair, he didn't have much competition beforehand, but that's certainly a title that a few could lay claim to since. But I still think Arthur's uh, king for me. Um, came in at a time, you know, for, we've, we've had five great years under Martin, um, but it was probably one of the positions where he would admit it, 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 he did struggle a bit. You know, Gildy got phased out for, for Big Rab, who was, you know, a goalie as honest as a day is long, but, you know, we, we would never say that he was um, an absolute top drawer. And then maybe... Magnus Hedman, you know, another high-profile one. You could probably argue he was the Barkas um, of his day. Big international, big outlay. It just didn't work out. And then um, David Marshall had his heroics in the new camp, but again, pretty timid and quite quite a, a shy boy, which is very hard. You know, you need to have a, a, a big personality to command the Celtic goal. And, um, and, and Arthur Boric, by God, did we not get it? Um, as I say, crazy. It's absolute mental case there's no, no other way to describe him an absolute nut job I think he described himself actually in one of the Celtic uh, title DVDs but behind all that was just a top top uh, quality goalkeeper um, I'm trying to think you know but we always obviously love the fact that he just loved sticking it uh, to our rivals um, more often than not when he was uh, breaking their hearts with world class save after world class save but um, I'd probably say my favourite memory of him was just um, the night where we qualified for the last 16 of the Champions League for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, we just witnessed Shinsuke Nakamura do one of the great European moments in history for me with that free kick against Van der Sar um, to put us ahead against Manchester United. But then, you know, we think our hearts are about to get broken as we conceded a penalty in the dying seconds and the big man just palmed uh, the penalty away. And that was us uh, first time in the last 16. Um, I suppose there's other, and you had other great moments in Europe and domestically as well, but that's probably my favourite, um, just for what it meant and who it was against. But um, I love him to bits. I think he's just one of the characters that, you know, you just never know what was coming next, apart from a, a top draw uh, save. Love him, and I just uh, hope he has a, a great retirement. Um, and he's, he's alluded to it in his interview. He's uh, planning on being back at Celtic Park plenty of times now. I can't wait to see him. Love him to bits. I think he was one of the first people well, of my generation that fully bought into Celtic Football Club, the whole ethos around it. And he came in, he, he took it under his wing. And I think you're right to say, we had some goalkeepers before him, obviously not up to that standard. Douglas, Goulding, 
uh, Hedman, Marshall, when he was first coming up, he kind of displaced Marshall, and Marshall had to leave Celtic because he couldn't get in. And James is finally back with us. It's great to see. But coming to yourself, James, Arthur, Arthur Boric, like, what a keeper. And you, you stole the one I was going to say about my memory, Anthony, that, that night against United. He was just heroic. Some of the saves he made. I know we've seen performances from Fraser Forrester, people like that, but Boric, for me, was unbelievable. He, he was everything that Celtic needed at that time, a character to come in, kind of leaving behind the ear of Martin O'Neill Get into Gorna Strachan. He drove them years. He was a key player. And just for yourself, to sum him up, what would you say, James? I, I, I actually wrote about him the, today after I knew I was coming on here. Um, obviously, we've got the same good memories, but um, I think that I, I think my alphabetic memory is always going to be the way he conducted himself both during and after the whole um, scandal of the. Um, Sign of the cross at Ibrox. Because um, a lot of people in his position might have, you know, lost their high a wee bit or that and asked for a transfer and I can't, can't stay in this country any longer. But he handled it great. He handled it brilliantly. He left it in the hands of the club and basically just got on with the job. And that must have been a heavy situation for a guy like him to be in. His, his comprehension of the whole situation must have been zero because it, it, he's never had a problem with anywhere he's ever been, either before or since. And it, it must just have been incomprehensible for him to understand what he had come in and why it was such a big deal. But he handled it great. And I've got good memories of him, but the way he handled that is probably the best memory I've got of him. Yeah, he's an absolute lads. And I think I heard the, the commentator said he was over 60 caps for, for Poland, represented the likes of Southampton and uh, Florentina, in his career like a Warsaw where he began it. And at Celtic Football Club, he chose us for the his final game. So that kind of sees the mark of the man. And we'll move on to the game, James. And I'll start with you in this one. And it just quite simply got the first half. Had Hate stole the show for me. I thought he was absolutely fantastic. I remember him towards the end of last season when he done one of them interviews he does like a blog thing for a japan kind of website and he was kind of misquoting what he said about in terms of he can't keep up but what he was really trying to say once he gets to full fitness he'll be a different kind of machine and it looks like this pre-season you can see that already the the goal that he took that first touch finish was absolutely incredible with mcgregor's pass over the top and his pass into Mieta for the second goal it was just sublime wasn't it yeah i, th- I thought he's, i think he's had a great pre-season um and that's kind of Ties it to something that I've been meaning to write an article about this for a couple of for about a week now. Um, on who the star the star man is going to be this season. And every time I've watched this in pre-season, I've changed my mind. But before the season, before pre-season started, I wrote one about Hitati and said that he could be the guy, that he could be the guy that all Europe is talking about by the time our Champions League run ends. And he's certainly looking like he's capable of that. Yeah, I think he's a phenomenal, phenomenal player. He is. I think like, when you look at Anthony more in depth, and I know we've got Mieta and uh, Kyogo, they've kind of stole the headlines, and Edoguchi, he's obviously the one kind of a slow burner, but Hatate, we were all told by like the journalists over there, he's the one who's going to kick on, possibly earn yeah, yeah. like a, a big transfer for Anthony, but so far this pre-season, how do you think he's done? Because for me, I think he's been one of our positive, positive standouts. Yeah, I agree, and yeah, he had, he had a fantastic, especially first half on uh, on Wednesday night. Um, took his goal absolutely brilliantly. Um, you know, it's a hard technique to do that. You know, the ball over the top, and then obviously claimed the assist as well uh, for Maeda for for the second goal. Um, looked quite iconic uh, in the gum shield as well. Looks like he's not going oh, to be really yeah. a scrap this season. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, we, we've seen his qualities when he, when he first uh, joined. I mean, he, I mean, to coin a Mika's Richards phrase, he burst onto the scene. Um, you know, and um, he had a great game uh, in his opening match against Hibs. Didn't score that night. It was obviously Ma- Maeda got in the score sheet, but some of his um, turns and just the way he just took Hibs players out of the game in the middle of the park without even touching the ball. I remember there was a moment, I, um, I can't remember if it was Starfield or, um, or CCV that, that passed it to him, but he didn't actually touch the ball. He just turned and just took one of the Hibs boys that was, you know, tasked with marking him just out of the game. The way he just went directly past him and he, you know, he pinged a, a great ball and started another attack. Following week, 
puts an absolute exocet missile into the uh, into to, to you know shut up the wee huns at Tyne Castle, which is always <laughs> a beautiful. And then he absolutely put the big ones to the sword uh, the week later, um, and you're just like, this guy is going to be, you know, going for fifty million in the summer here. But you know, it, naturally, it's impossible for a, a, a guy to keep up that to that kind of relentlessness. Um, but he's he, he didn't have very many, but you could tell, like you say, by the end of the, the season, he was definitely feeling the fatigue of, you know, back-to-back seasons without a, a rest. And um, I think James has mentioned that a, um, a few times in some of his articles about one of the, the best things about this pre-season is not having the, the qualifiers to have to worry about and stuff. And we can just focus on these friendlies and, you know, you know testimonials and stuff just to get back into the, the swing of it and gradually increase the, the, the sort of stature and you know, demands and stuff of the, of the team. So it's allowed Tati to just sort of take a wee bit of breathing space and, you know, sort of re-establish himself, if that's the, the right word. But I think he's, he, he's looking terrific. I think, like James has said, I actually think um, it might even have been, I think that Stillian Petrov have not got quoted on Sky as well, saying, he maybe fancies Hattati for player of the year already. Ooh, and that was right. before pre-season yeah. had even started. So these guys all know that there's 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 something there. And um, I just can't wait to see it when he goes full 100 mile an hour when the season starts. 100%. He's an absolutely fantastic player. And also, Craig White, the legend, thanks very much for becoming a YouTube member. Absolutely incredible. And I just want to say a big shout out to everyone who's joined us this early on as well. Charles Smithson. Kieranson, who, by the way, called out my top again. This is a running theme in these podcasts. <laughs> I am in holiday mode. There is palm trees and stuff in this top. I'm sticking to it. I'm happy. I'm comfy. But thanks for calling out. Every time I wear Umbro, I get slagged. Every time I wear something different, I get slagged. But sure, keep it coming. It's all in good fun anyway. And top again, top, for people, Captain. <laughs> and for people who's watching, you can take a fancy to that uh, YouTube member thing by just joining it says underneath the we subscribe thing just join the, the podcast it's 99 p.m. month brilliant get a wee emoji beside your name all singing all dancing thanks to John for that one as well cracker but James you look at it too I mean there's another midfield player I want to kind of put the microscope on and that's Matt O'Reilly now I think we, we can't really do a podcast without talking about this fellow at the minute because against Lego Warsaw he hit the post twice once from a header and then once from a strike inside the box but with his left foot whipped round and I've seen him on Sky Sports today talking, saying he wants to fulfil his ambitions. Obviously, cliche stuff, playing in the Champions League, trophies, blah, blah, blah. But his confidence in himself is good to see. People will mistake it for arrogance, much like they did with Yakimakis last season, when he said we were the best team in Scotland. That kind of got blew up, but look what happened. What do you think about Matt O'Reilly at the minute? Um, I, I love the guy. I, he's, he's a puzzle to me, though. I don't know why. I keep writing Ben O'Reilly when I'm Doing articles and then having to change it in the I don't even know who Ben O'Reilly is. I don't know where this is came from. I forget his freaking name, man. And I said he was English the other day, and somebody pointed out that he's a Danish international, so I need to stop doing that as well. But yeah, I love this guy. Yeah. He's, he's one of the players as well that we didn't really realise what we had signed. And it's only now that you hear all these different people from England saying, oh, yeah, he was a class act and I recommended him to this club. And uh, we always knew he was going to do big things and all that. It's, it's a real coup for us to have got somebody like that. If, if there is, you know, if, if the word in England always was that he was a superstar in the main, it's, it's quite amazing that we went out and done that business. And it's even more amazing that we were supposed to have Riley McGree instead. And... Um, <laughs> We've, we've definitely ended up with the right guy. It's a, it's a bit like the Andrew Pointman. It wasn't the first choice, but it's the right choice and the best choice, no question. I think we would agree. He can't even get his place from Middlesbrough. As far as I knew last season, he barely, he barely got a look in and they did all that promo about him when he was, I'd rather wear red and all this bullshit that people do when they kind of jump on the bandwagon, awfully. But I think you're 100% right. You see that you see the people come out saying Liverpool's been tracking them for five years, doing the stats and the progression and stuff, and they were going to take a chance, but no one did. We've picked them up, Anthony. Yeah. 1.5 million pounds from MK Dons. And I know it's drummed on a lot on these Celtic podcasts, but that's an absolute yeah. steal for us to yeah. do that. Get him to come in. And by all means, he's took Rodzik's place seamlessly, being the first choice, number 10, which he inevitably will be this season. He scored two cracking goals already this preseason, assisted a few. And then he could have smashed in a couple against Lego. He's been absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I think he, he, he wrote absolutely perfect in comparing them to Rogic. It's a similar type of 
way that he's, he's, he's he is on the ball. He just looks like you say it looks effortless. It doesn't look like he's breaking any sweat when he's on the pitch. But he knows what he's doing with a football at his feet. And uh, yeah, 1.5 million these days. You know, when you think of some of the some of the players out there that could command higher fees that, that just simply don't work out, you're absolutely buying on, Stephen. We've got an absolute steal here. He's another one like Katati, who I think we're going to see the real Fritzy's labour um, as this season goes on. And um, yeah, I, I think him and Katati have probably, if you were to pick a full-strength team with everyone available, I think most... Yeah people would probably have those two guys in their team um, at the moment. So, um, yeah, the minute this season kicks off, I think they'll be be absolutely raring to go. And, uh, yeah, can't wait to see them in action uh, when the real action starts. Yeah, it's been absolutely... like The pre-season itself, I mean, I think we've had two wins and four draws at the minute. Um, Some of them draws were kind of probably avoidable, James, when you look at it. Move on to the the defence side of things, which I've having quite a lot of fun talking about recently. I seem to be getting a few tips and arguments, but here that's what, what that's what it's all about—a bit bit of disagreement. But for me, I'll give my kind of two pence on it. When you're two 0 up, and I know it's not a, a competitive game, people say it's pre-season, right? But Ange Postecoglou came out and said he picked these games for a reason. They kind of feel the European atmosphere, feel that intimidation, and at the moment we're leaking goals from a winning position, and that for me isn't a good thing. And I know it's pre-season, but we're two games away from Aberdeen at Norwich and then Aberdeen. But how are you feeling about it at the minute? Supremely confident, actually. Um, I, I mean, I know we don't like to lose goals. We don't like to lose goals, right? But a lot of those goals have been lost when we've had... Effectively had B teams on the pitch. And as I said to my old man the other day, and I wrote this in the article I wrote after the game, if we at any point during the season field a side that has Stephen Welsh, Eddie Gucci, James McCarthy, and Mikey Johnson in it. That will be a that will be a that will be a cause for concern. But we'll never have those those guys will never be in a starting eleven. We'll never see those guys in the starting eleven. We can get away with maybe one or two of those guys in the team at the same time. I mean the nine regular players, but as as Mixing the team up to that degree. And it's not that these guys are bad players and they won't do a job for us. It's that these guys don't play in the same team every week. They don't have the understanding that the first team players have. Um, and there's no real way to get them that except to play them every week and we're never going to do that. So it's, it's, to me, that's, that's why you don't really learn anything in the pre-season. Um, because I've just been playing the strongest teams in the first half and then subbing everybody and bringing on the backup team in the second half. Now, even the backup team, has got good players in it. That's the strength of the squad at the moment. But not 11 players are going to play together at any point. Not 11 players that you're going to see in the team every week. So there is a bit of a disjointed look to it and it, a lot of mistakes have been made as a result. And that's what I put it down to. I don't, I'm not overly concerned. The best defence in the country last season will be the best defence in the country this season. I have no doubt about that at all. I mean, I, I get what you're saying, 100%. But again, I'm coming from the point... You're looking at Anthony, you're coming in the, the close of the pre-season, right? And James makes a great point. I think we referred to this on our chat as well, the podcast one, where you're bringing on heaps of substitutes in the second half. It kind of takes the momentum away from the game. And we all know if we had to kept the same 11 for the second half against the leg, it probably would have smashed them. I think we can all agree on that. It should have been six or seven going into, going into the second half anyway, apart from a few chances that were missed off the post and things. But my, my main concern is I've seen Fickner's being bullied off the ball. Never seen that happen before. Your man put it away past Scott Bain. Who, by the way, for that second goal was absolutely woefully out of position. Your man struck <laughs> it just by, by luck and it went in the bottom left hand post. But I, I have a funny feeling here you're going to be on James's side because I, I know what he's saying. But I'm just a wee bit of a panic merchant, I have to admit myself, because you, you look at your going to European competition, you'll be playing against the big the biggest clubs in the world. So I mean, effectively, he cannot be making them them basic errors going into that. Yeah, I mean, you never like conceding goals. Of course, of course, you don't. It doesn't matter whether it's um, a game of tiddlywinks or if it's Champions League <laughs> last sixteen. You do, you don't you don't like conceding goals. But James is absolutely bang on with the you know the way that the preseason has been. It's all about getting the top boys in the first half the most amount of minutes, the highest party intensity of uh, uh, the workout, because they're the guys that are going to be carrying the heaviest load um, as the season goes on. And, and you know, like you say, if there's a point in the season where we do have James McCarthy, Stephen Welsh, Lawal, um, 
God, Scott Bain and goals for a start. I mean, my God, <laughs> that's, that's absolutely a case for jumping out the window. But you know, it's um, I think you know we don't have to worry too much, Stephen. I just I would I'll, I'll simmer you down from the from the boil because I know you I know you don't like it when uh, when we can see goals and that's absolutely natural. But um, I, I like I say, I'm I'm not panicking too much. Like I say, if there's a point when those guys are on the pitch at the one time, I will absolutely join you in that panic room. But uh, until then, <laughs> it's just a case of getting more minutes in the legs. As I said, it'll probably be the same again tomorrow. The guys that will, or who will more or less be the, the starting team against Aberdeen the week later will start. At half time, there'll be about five or six changes. Whoever's left on the pitch will get brought off at 60 minutes. And, and that'll be the case. I would imagine between 60 minutes and 90 of them are is not going to be one for the ages either. But it's just a, a precaution to make sure, like, as James says, the kind of, the reserves almost, the reserve to the first team is um, is fit and ready if needed um, to be called upon. Yeah, 100%. I think Stevie Boy sums that up there. John and Stephen on different nights, now in case shit gets real. <laughs> yeah, you're 100%. <laughs> we're, we're staying away from each other at the minute. Kaiser comes in here. James with a good point. First 11 must get 70 minutes in my book. In, in the next game here against Norwich. And you, you touched mm-hmm. upon some names there, right? Now, I do want to come back to this because of, about Welsh, about Uruguini. You look at Albin Yeti, James, in pre-season. He came on for that that game there. I think it was, and he was just, he did, didn't care. <laughs> Trying to shift him is going to be a tough job, yeah. isn't it? And then you look, you look at Segrist. Now, this is what it kind of bugged me a bit. Why did Segrist not get in before Bain? Because he was named on the bench and we're all there to believe he's yeah. he's meant to be our second choice. So, it's a bit up there, but in, in the squad itself, when you're still in this transfer window and you're trying to trim it, who would be the first ones you'd get rid of? Uh, getting rid of Albion, yeah, he's got to be the number one priority right now for the club. Him and, and, and probably Chris Julian, now that we brought in a new defender. Um, but uh, moving on, yeah, he's going to be the tax of all time because we're the second failure in a row. And... Um, that's not a good look, man. That's not a good look. Yeah, he, he got away with one in England because it was the Premier League and because mm-hmm. he was coming to a new club and a new culture and all that. And this is... He's been here for, what, two years now and he's not looked... He's looked miles off it. So it, it's going to be the task of all time to get it down. Um, possibly I move back to Switzerland if his wages are only inflated beyond then and they can afford. But that must be getting the... It must be giving the Celtic accounting department nightmares. Wondering what the hell we're going to do. With that. I think it's 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 hard, and that Anthony. I mean, he he was great at, when he was in Switzerland at Ball, and then yeah. he went to West Ham, and he kind of failed, as you said, his second failure in a row. You look at it; he came on a pre-season, one interest. It doesn't really do well for himself to get a move because people just go, "Well, he just doesn't care." So, what's the point of putting a checkbook out to sign him? You look at Julian. I think James made a great point. I'm not going to bring him up in the this whole 20 minute conversation this is the last <laughs> podcast we're on to, but the, the signing of the defender Jens I think I'm pronouncing that right I know you were looking forward to me hearing me hear me sign up the podcast but the writing's on the wall for me for him Urigidi another person probably about an only gain or a permanent transfer so as Anne said today there is plenty of trimming left to be done isn't there yeah yeah I think so I mean it's a strange one we are yet because I think we were all prepared this time last year to give him a clean slate because of the disaster of season one. And because yeah. when he first joined, he obviously scored the winner at Tanadice. He looked, do you know, he had that kind of, um, same kind of uh, sort of thing that Abada's got. But at the time, it, like they were, it, when Abada was on a bit of a scoring run when he first joined last season, yeah. none of the goals were particularly fancy, but they were always like sort of rebounds or just being in the right yeah. place at the right time. And yet he was shown that the year before um, in the COVID season. But, I mean, and, and we, as I say, we were prepared. I think actually Angie's first game, he gave a Yeti the captaincy, you know, b- believe it or not. And I think that was a, a case of the fact, let's um, let's try and see if we can, you know, get a bit of confidence in this guy. Um, and then even the night against Betis, where I actually did feel sorry for him because he looked like he was pressing more, he was putting in more effort and then he pulled up with the injury. Yeah. But I must admit, I was kind of the same way as you, Stephen, on the opening night, um, the opening game. Uh, I can't remember their name now. Um, 7-0, seven, 7-8-0, seven seven, we won that night. But when he came yeah. on, he just didn't, he, he looked like he would rather be anywhere but, but where he was. And like you say, the fact that that comes on the back of a failed time in England as well, 
there will be a, ho- a host of clubs that maybe would have been um, interested parties this time last year, um, perhaps are, are not interested. And I, and I do think it's probably the fact that Yeti's on the books and we paid a lot of money for him. So I dare say he's on a, a decent wage as well. It might well be the case that um, the powers that be are maybe saying, right, well, we'll up front anyway, I, I don't think for one minute that he alone will be the reason Jordan Larson didn't sign for for, for to, to, to <laughs> try and make the point. But I think there will be a few of the, the sort of bean counters going, well, hang on a minute, you know, we we do need to get, we need, like you say, we do need to trim some of the squad um, before we, you know, spend big again. So, yeah, a Yeti, I think, has, has cards marked. Um, he's hats on a, or his coat's on a shiggly peg, as we say in Scotland. Um, and again, you know, we said last week, as much as we, as, as much as you were very much fighting a, a losing battle, you would argue uh, last week for, uh, with me and Willie, with, with Julian, my whole thing was it will all depend on whether or not we bring in um, either Julian was sold or if another centre half came in. And now that one has, um, and you know he's not featured much either against Blackburn. He only came on for about ten minutes against Blackburn last week, and he, you know he didn't really. I, I can't remember if he came on at all on Wednesday. But yeah, I, I would be very surprised if um, if he's not going to if if he'll feature at all. Now I think the the signing of another centre half kind of probably confirms that. I think Egyptian King Nur Ayari is our modern day Raji Blinker. Maybe a disservice to Reggie Blinker. I don't know. It wasn't old enough <laughs> to see him play properly. But, I mean, we'll, we'll go on to the signings that were made during the week, James. I know you tried to take a few days off, but you were straight back on that computer making articles about the two new boys that come in. And we'll talk yeah. about our Moy first. Now, <clears throat> for me, it's a pretty underwhelming signing. One, a bit, it feels a bit like McCarthy for me. Like I know I know McCarthy definitely 100% wasn't post to call new signing. He got a four-year deal. And he's basically done F all since he's been the doors of Celtic Park. Aaron Moy, he's came from the Chinese Super League. Not even going to pronounce the club he played for because he'll be slaughtered for it. Um, he, he played minimal games, I think about 12 or 14 last season. He had a bad injury as well he's recovering from in, in previous seasons when he, he left England and things. But 31 years old, a one-year deal with an option of a, a, a year, isn't it, James? Or is it a, a two-year deal confirmed? I think it was on the website. I can't remember. But starting for that signing, how did you feel about that one? I'm I'm chuffed about that signing. Um, that, that that looked like a no-brainer to me. I, I, the, the second that we found out that the, the Chinese couple got to release him, I thought that that was nearly certain to happen. It, it almost happened last season, but I think the wage demands and the fact that they wanted some kind of transfer fee for him is what scuppered it. Um, but Ange was very keen to make him a signing last season. And I, I, the second day, at least, I knew we would get him. Um, th- that deal, obviously, one of the things that throws a lot of people is that deal seems to have been, seems to have taken a long time today. Now, I was writing about how long the deals, some of the deals were taken today. But that one in particular must have been in the works for a while. But we couldn't complete that signing until he'd actually been released to his contract, which was only days before so but to me that was a no-brainer and I knew we would sign him and, uh, and I'm pleased that we did because Andrew obviously knows what he's getting he obviously knows what the guy can do he probably knows exactly where he wants to play him in the team so uh, it, it was a simple one for me you know I, I'm not so much worried about the guy's age Scott Brown was a Celtic first team regular at 33 or 34 and could have gone on another year um these guys who look after themselves and are well conditioned, these guys can play longer than ever. Um, and the guys who have been at the top of the game do play longer than ever. I mean, Barcelona have just signed um, uh, Lewandowski, and he must be 36. And he's got a three-year deal and he's on massive salary and will certainly be a huge asset to their club. I mean, that. The modern players can play longer than they've ever been able to play. The ones that look after themselves anyway, not the wee Griffiths, <laughs> but the ones that take care of themselves and take the take the profession seriously. And this guy's obviously one of them, otherwise he wouldn't have been near the place. James McCarthy is a strange one. He's that's that's a really odd thing. I don't think there were very many people that I know who didn't think he would be a success. But he's he's clearly not cut out for whatever role. 
and just tried to play him in the team. I mean, that defensive midfield role where he used where he used to play, he does have legs for that anyway. He can't even run about and no. cover the ground the way that role requires. And so, uh, I don't know. I, I still hope that James McCarthy plays some role in the season and that James McCarthy proves that he's a good player because he's definitely a good player. But maybe just not cut out for this team right now in the way the manager wants to play. But Moy has been signed for a completely different job. I mean, I, yeah. I, I think he's I think Hans, he's having some kind of deep line playmaker who just pass the ball here, there, and everywhere and, and create opportunities for people. Yeah, I mean, I do get what you're saying. And I, I kind of, I do want to obviously back up on that a bit. The Aaron Moy one for me, you're saying about ages and stuff. James McCarthy, by all accounts, is a fantastic professional. And he doesn't have the legs no more. Obviously, it's still up there to see if Moy he's can do that because he's no cut. He's, he's had a couple of serious injuries in his career that curtailed his, his development as a Aye. player as well. McCarthy, McCarthy, more than any other player, needs to play 10, 15 games in a row before we see what, anything like what the best team is. And that's not feasible in the current Celtic team. That's, it's not feasible to drop somebody just to get McCarthy up to speed. Unfortunately, yeah, you can't do that, especially if the, if the club's winning. You, you don't break up a winning uh, formula, James. And you, you come to yourself, Anthony, here. Craig White, the legend, the brand new member of this podcast, fantastic to have you aboard. Said, Do you think the Moy signing spells the end for Turnbull? Now, that's a, a quite drastic one, right? Because the scene Paul, Paul Dad on the him says, Does it spell the end for McCarthy? So there's two different types of player being thrown up here. Mm-hmm. And you do look at it, the midfield is a bit bloated. Now, in terms of what's their quality and depth, you could probably do about two or three midfields and be quite secure in who you yeah. pick in that in that formation. So, do you think there's a midfield player maybe on its on, on their way out, or do you think it's Anne's kind of consolidating the squad and just beefing it up a wee bit after losing Beaton and Rosic? Yeah, well, funnily enough, as much as I didn't I, um, I agree with the, with the first um, question that came up there, is it the end for Turnbull? The fact that then the, the one underneath um, asked, is it the end for McCarthy? That right there is the nail getting hit on the head. That's exactly the reason why he's been signed. Because Turnbull and McCarthy, if you know, they are two completely different players. Yeah. They play, you know, they they offer different. You know, you imagine a fully fit McCarthy, a match fit McCarthy, and one that was in the team is a completely different player to a fully fit Turnbull. You know where I'm, I'm going with this, Stephen. But the fact yeah. is that Moy, it's his versatility. Uh, versatility, sorry, he can play in a, a number of different roles. And like you say, regarding his age, I get that, you know, 31, you know, it's not the new 21 by any stretch, but like you say, in this modern day, it's not the case where 32, 33, these guys are, are gone. Um, not, not for most of them now. Most of these footballers, very few of them, you know, you know drink or, or eat unhealthily to any kind of excess. They're, they're, they're finely tuned. Athletes and for what I can see of Moy, um, he seems to fit that mould. You know, he looks. There's not a pick on him, and um, he, he looks more than ready for the demands of the SPL. In, in my eyes, McCarthy, and I, and I get why does it spell the end for McCarthy? I think it'll. I don't really think it does in the sense that I was probably one of the few that, and I agree that you know McCarthy. I don't think was necessarily an Ange signing, but I think Ross touched on this on Monday. I think he. He, he was happy enough for him to come in because he's obviously heard of him and he, he knows what, what he is capable of. And this type, what we, it is night and day for this time last season, what the what the squad looks like in terms of morale, shape, what we're going up against. Um, we just needed some guys in the door. And James McCarthy did tick a lot of boxes in terms of, he was, you know, obviously he was, he was a relatively risk-free, or, I mean, the four-year deal it does still raise an eyebrow. There's no doubt about that, but, you know, he, he, he knew the club to an extent. He grew up supporting the club, and he knows he's he's definitely got enough in his CV to merit getting a deal on a free transfer. But I, I must admit, I was always one of the ones that thought he's actually did more or less what I kind of thought he would do in the sense that you know I know he probably featured a little bit more at the start of the season, but I always did see him as the sort of I mean I call them the the League Cup players. You know, the guys that come in, do the job. Yeah. In the early stages of the Cups, or if you're maybe at home to St Mirren or something like that, or um, a team like that, or you maybe come on in one of the big, against one of the bigger teams for the last ten minutes to see the game out. You know, you put, you know, just get another. It's a case of making another substitution. I'm not saying that's necessarily the most essential role of the team, but I did think that's essentially what 
he was signed for. And I think, I mean, you can't say, you could never class him as a success, but I think he's just did what I think Ange's expected of him. So I don't think it necessarily means the end for him at Celtic, but it certainly puts him even further down the pecking order in terms of starting position. But this is going to be a long, long season. You know, I, I, I think the Champions League is going to be a, a, a massive learning curve. Um, an exciting one, but a learning curve nonetheless. Um, you know, all the teams that we you know, we've got the target on our back again for the league champions again. So everyone will be, you know, try to raise their game an extra five, ten percent, even more than they already do against us. Um, so we're going to need everybody to be ready. Similar to kind of what, what Klopp does at Liverpool. Doesn't matter who's in the first eleven; they all know what's expected of them, and they need to be ready to go at any given moment. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, to touch on the transfer itself, I'm I'm delighted. As I say, he's a player that Ange knows. I think he'll he'll cover a, a few rules. Whether he whether he's an automatic starter every week or not, that remains to be seen. But I think it was the, the term "no brainer" um, springs to mind. As for the the I centre think- half, I'm not going to um, you know sit here and say I'm any kind of expert on him. I have never seen him play in my life. So um, I'm purely at the mercy of Ange and the Celtic Scouting Network. Um, but the fact that you know, when, when Ange was talking about him and it looked as if there was you know discussions had started as early as last season, the type of manager Ange is, you know that he'll have um, had guys watching him all season uh, and picking up every, you know, every last bit of information and data that there is to know about him. Um, before he signed off on the deal, um, so it's a kind of it's a kind of it's a sort of same sort of setup as CCV. I'm led to believe it's um, yeah. one season loan with an option yeah. to buy, which is which is great. You know, if he put, comes in and proves himself, then we've got the option there next year um, to spend some of what will hopefully be next year's Champions League kitty. Um, if not, you know, we can we, but both parties can cut their losses. But um, yeah, I think. It just keeps that momentum going, another two in the building. And for what Ange says, that's not the end of the transfer dealing. So it's all yep. good in the hood. And we'll, we'll come on there as you're in the hood reference again. And the funny you mentioned a, a League Cup team when you hit the, the fact of Cup goalkeepers, Anthony, but sure. And then Lanky67 comes fair, in. Fair point. I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> fair point. And, uh, Lanky67 says, look at Milner, for example, still in great shape and can still play. And I think he's still tapping the fitness charts at Liverpool as well, James. And before we move on, that's a good point for Mike, it definitely is. Before we move on in terms of the, the defender, Jens, coming in, one thing I do want to touch upon briefly, one player we're, we're totally missing from the whole situation here who kind of plays in that role as well is Edoguchi. And for me, I think he's looked better than McCarthy. He's tenacious, he can tackle. You've seen him fill in at number eight, number six in the preseason games. Do you think... And, you look at McCarthy, he's getting slightly edged towards a lesser, lesser role. Or is it Eddie Gucci? Is he not? I mean, it makes you think, doesn't it? Why is he not getting more of a, a look at him? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought Eddie Gucci had a. I think Eddie Gucci had a really strong preseason. Um, and I think out of the two of them, he would definitely be the most likely to play a bigger role in the team. Um, honestly, I feel terrible for James McCarthy. I banked the James McCarthy from for a lot of years, and I wrote, a, and I wrote, James McCarthy was one of the summer go-to transfer stories, right? And I know something almost happened a couple of years before, because he was telling people who my family knows that the deal was done and all that, and he was on the way to sell it, and something happened, and it never came off. So it's one of the ones that I, I was really pleased about when it happened, and I just, I cannot fathom what has gone wrong, except that the pace of the team is completely different from what he has ever been yeah. used to. And he's, he's not adapted to it and he's not going to adapt to it. I mean, it's clear he's not going to adapt to it. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, we don't know if he's going to be his contract terminated. No one's saying that. He could play a role in some, as Anthony said, League Cup football or playing a, a meaningless game if you've got the league wrapped up. So, sorry, Stephen, just, I'll be very, very quick. With this. One thing I'll just say again in, in his favour, as I say, the one... You have to give him credit for, and again, it must maybe be out of respect for Ange as well. Although he's perhaps not been as um, involved in the, as the team as he thought he was, you don't see him running to any of the no. succulent lamb journalists at the Daily Record or any of the other no. uh, papers' names that I won't um, I won't let pass my tongue. Um, he he's a consummate professional, he's, and he's maybe just accepted that that's what his role's going to be now. 
Um, and he wants to, you know, I, I think he'll do enough. I think he qual- done enough last season to qualify for a medal. That'll have meant the world to him win- winning it with Celtic. Um, so, uh, like I say, I don't think he's going to be one of these guys that's going to be causing Ange too, too many uh, problems. So, And I think uh, you do need those type of characters in the dressing room too. So, like you say, I think Idegiche and many others are ahead of him in the pecking order. But it's always good just keeping uh, some of the dyed in the wheel silks around as well. <laughs> 100%. And I think you're right in terms of that as well. You look at it as the experience could prove fatal. We will see. But one of the players who we did sign, James, and you briefly touched on, on him there often, is uh, the Jens, the centre-back from Lorient. He moved from the Swiss League to the, uh, the French League, and albeit he didn't really have a, a good time of it last season, going by the stats that you see on Twitter and people kind of promoting that. But you do read and it just to get a look at the player's profile. And then, what uh, Anthony made a great point about McCarthy accepting this kind of squad player role and, and it's fate at Celtic and the, one of the journalists asked gents what do you think your role is going to be can you see yourself challenging and he just referred it back to the old cliche that everyone says in the post the team we're all aiming for the same goal as a team together and he's already breaking that mould and he's fitting in perfectly well but what what's your overall kind of understanding if you have any but the, the profile of the signing do you like it is it a forward thinking one I think one of our central defenders is in real trouble in terms of his team place because this guy was the guy we were going to sign before the two of them, before we signed both of them. This guy was in the thoughts last season. And he was the guy we were going to sign before Starfelt, before Carter Vickers. So the manager likes this guy. He's not coming in to make up the numbers or be anybody's backup. He's coming out to challenge for the first team place and he will right from day one. Who do you think he's going to take? Who do you think is most under threat then? Um, we spent a lot of money on Carl Vickers in the summer. Um, and I know most people think it will be Starfelt. But my, my, my jokes about this, he said, um, he's looked at the, some of the goals we've conceded in pre-season and says, are we missing Starfelt that much? And I said, maybe we are. <laughs> maybe we are. <laughs> Do you think? Do you, I honestly think the Carter Vickers could be under pressure from half? I honestly thought you were going to say Starfelt there because usually that's where people go with that. But to say Vickers, it's a brave call, James. To be honest, like well, you never know. You you just never know. I know one of them's in a lot of trouble, and I know one of them is going to be fighting for a place. And absolutely, yeah. having to be perfect every week to keep a place in the team. Yeah, I find it interesting that he he did say quite publicly that they've been in talks throughout the season. Possible called new contact them last season and have spoken numerous times, Anthony. So, James might be right here. It could be a question of perfection needs must get into this season. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, and I think probably the the fact. That, I mean, it's never great when you're injured anyway. But Starfield couldn't have probably got injured at a, a worse time because I think he's um, you know, he had established a fantastic partnership with CCV. And, you know, the, the two of them had learned of both sides' um, strengths and weaknesses. But the fact, you know, literally, if, you, if you're injured, you can't play. So it now offers, yeah, and obviously, and we have the big outlay as well, like you say, for, for Carter Vickers. So you would imagine um, that possibly going forward, we might even see it for its first time tomorrow, that Carter Vickers and, and Jens, to start with, um, will, be the, will be the partnership. Um, so it'll be up to Starfelt now. To, yeah. to really have to stay and fight for his place, you know, you might staff belt might find himself in the Chris Julian position, and it's a case of you know, are you up for the fight or, you, or are you not? But um, but listen, the 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 out get the end game of that, um, or the or the outcome of it, if there's three top quality defenders fighting for two places, yeah. um, the only upset there's no downside to that for Celtic as as a as a wider you know. You know, sort of thought. Um, the only that's only going to do well for us, which can only be a good thing. As I say, you come to the big clubs, and this is a massive club. Um, you got to be ready to fight for your place every week. Hundred percent, mate. And Stevie Boy comes in. What if Julian starts playing with his skin, <laughs> Stephen? Imagine Big Jansen and Julian. <laughs> I know everyone. They're trying to get me triggered again here. It's not happening tonight. Egyptian King. I'm excited to see how Carter Vickers and Jan's partnership goes. Uh, Kevin 14, another member, brilliant to see. It's an option. JD, Starfelt and Carter Vickers will be looking over their shoulders. That's a good thing. And there, there's a lot of talk here before we move on. Uh, James regarding formations. And I've seen a few people suggest three at the back. Do you think that's an option? What's that? Like the 3-5-2 type formation? 
I know for Mason. Um, he, um, possible, very possible. I'd, I, I think all of us would love to see this guy find a way to get Kyogo and Jack and Marcus in the same team. I yeah. think all of them would love to see that. I think the manager himself would love to find a way to do it. Because I, I could see that being quite formidable and I could see that being very worrying for teams in Scotland <laughs> and even a few in Europe. I, so I, I don't know. I know possibly, very possibly. I, I know it's something he tried when he was in Japan managing that team as well and it was quite successful. But I do want to move on. This is quite off topic, right? But it's something that's been in the back burner of my mind. So sorry if it comes as a shock, but I think it's mm-hmm. it's in mainstream news everywhere here, Anthony. I'll start okay. yourself first. It's quite a tasty one, right? It's just regarding football as a general kind of landscape at the minute and the transfer scene. And we've seen the, 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 this hot topic, Jesse Lingard signed for Nottingham Forest for 180 grand a week. Simple, simple question to you. Is football done in terms of money? Well, probably straightforward answer to that is no. It's not done in terms of money and because... I mean, Obviously, I mean the, up, the figures. The figures that are being paid is it does. The figures are astronomical. Um, it is. It's hard for my synapses to try and process that in any kind of logical way. I mean, and I'm you know everyone knows my English club's Manchester United, so I've probably got you know more chance to comment on it than most. Jesse Lingard came through United's academy um, around the same time as Marcus Rashford. There's no denying the boy's a talented player. And I get that I'm not... I, 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 my generation's the generation before. I'd, I'd known a time before social media, so I'm not going to try... Simon Jordan, who I... As much as I disagree with a lot of his politics and stuff, I think he's fantastic on talk sport um, in a lot of ways, and he offers a, a football owner's point of view in, in a lot of ways. Um, he got, he's been criticised a lot of the, the last little while because he, he gave up sort of throwaway statement last week when this news broke. Um, he says Jesse Lingard's going to be famous for nothing more than his TikTok videos. Um, and, you know, some of the, his defenders <laughs> on the show tried to argue, you know, he's, you know, he scored the goal in the FA Cup final and this, that and the other. But I think, by and large, the, the guy's got a point. And, and I think the, what he was trying to say with that is, yeah, it's great, it's great scoring the one and goal for Man United in a cup, FA Cup final. Must be absolutely brilliant. But, you know, winning FA Cups is not what Man United's all about. So maybe somewhat else, I mean, great Celtic players have scored winning goals in Scottish Cup finals, but the most important thing is winning the league. And um, you, you can't just do it on one Cup final and that's it. Jesse Lingard, the, the, anyone that pays 200 grand a week for Jesse Lingard, is, it's crazy. It is, it is mind-boggling. And Nottingham Forest have clearly hung their hat on that because it must be a... It's a massive addition to their wage bill. Um, it's football. I mean, you, you, you obviously see all the things at Barcelona as well, with all these players getting... They, they claim they're pleading poverty on one hand, and then the next minute they're making you know record-breaking transfers and you know signing all these world-class players or potentially world-class players, um, but then they can't register them. And uh, I, I, I don't know if it's... I don't know if we'll ever reach a ceiling with it anytime soon, shall we say, Stephen. I think... Although the perhaps the Sky sort of model of you know paying a subscription and then you getting the the right the, a certain company signing the rights, oh, I can absolutely assure you, it's uh, John. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> I, I think uh, the, the way that mod that, that it's going at the moment, you know, Newcastle United just signing, you know, not just signing, getting taken over by the Saudis. It's football clubs aren't owned by the local rich businessmen anymore it's like a geopolitical thing now yeah. uh, and obviously sports washing comes into that as well all I, I don't know if it's done i don't think it will be done anytime soon all i can say categorically is i wholeheartedly hope it's a circus that we never ever join um i would re- always resist us going down to england i would always resist us joining anything involving some kind of sort of Super League or anything like that, which, you know, if, if we had another good couple of years in the Champions League, if this if that ever reared its ugly head again, you know, somebody might make a call to Dern that you never know. It's just not something I ever want. I never want... You know what we... And I know that football's and the world's moved on since 1887 when, you know, the first meeting was signed about 
about us becoming formed as a football club. But the mm-hmm. way, what, what, what makes up the majority of our support and the fact that we've never been bankrolled by a sugar daddy, and uh, despite what the Daily Record will tell you, I, I would never want Celtic to enter any kind of circus where we are competing 45, 50 million pound plus transfers fees, but we we're going to go to war with Man City over the latest wonder kid, or we're going to pay this you know, prima donna 200 grand a week to try and score against St Mirren. I, you know, I... I, I it, it, bog, it baffles me and, um, and I know that some of the argument is well, it would make you compete more in Europe you might even go the whole way in Europe for me the story of Lisbon is the greatest sporting story ever told and I know I'm biased on that but you know it, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that it is and it's it was done in a way that is alien to so many clubs even back then and it is now and I think winning, if we were to go down a Man City route but win another big silver one with the big ears, it would not be as incredible. It would not be as history defining um, as a moment in time as what Lisbon was. And I know I'm, I'm not a dinosaur. I know football's changed almost unrecognisably since then. But the principles, I think, of the club should remain the same. Barcelona always said that they were more than a club. They're not now. They're sponsored by Spotify. Do you know what I mean? Give me a break. This is... Um, it's a, as I say, it's a circus, and it's um, thankfully it's not my monkeys, and I don't want. I would re- resist Celtic joining any part of it. I mean, I have to say, there, <coughs> Anthony, that's a round of applause, buddy. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> you, you, you got that in a nutshell. And I'm glad you brought it around to Celtic, because that's where I was going to go with James. And the way I was coming across it, you're you're looking at it. These fees, and bappe has got the keys, the PSG, the change every he wants. Messi's getting paid numerous amount of money. Jesse Lingard making TikTok videos. He should do a duet with Julian, shouldn't he? Because they they would love that with each other. <laughs> Unbelievable. And then you got these astronomical fees. And I know there's this, me personally, I want sadly to compete financially. I want us to have the muscle, but keep the core of the club. And I know actually what he's saying there, sometimes that can be lost if these big earners are big transfer fees, selling your name and rights to your stadium like Barcelona have done with Spotify, all that type of thing. But there has to be a middle ground somewhere. And the reason why I asked this football done is because... As Anthony rightly said, I can't see an, an end to this cycle unless there's something that just goes drastically wrong within the La Liga, France League, the EPL, all them systems. It's just going to go bump and you'll be seeing transfer fees at 200, 300 million becoming normality. Yep. Agree. Totally agree. I mean, uh, I, I was reading the other day that, that, that Frankie de Jong would, would leave Barcelona for Manchester United except they owe him £17 million in back wages. <laughs> Has he done anything to justify the wages he's already had? Let alone mm-hmm. another £17 million. Pound. What is that? Where does that come from? It's mad. And I mean, the, 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 the way money has, has gotten out of control in football, some of the, some of the comments have already suggested that it's becoming like American sports um, in terms of the crazy salaries being offered, right? Yeah. The only difference is the NHL doesn't have over... 200 teams in it, like the English league system has, right? And and you know, even, even you know, the, the fees at the top of the game clearly can't be sustained, right? And definitely, I mean, it's, it's obviously can't be can't be sustained. The whole thing is built on football money for us or TV money for a start. And Germany's already experienced a football money crash um, with TV contracts. Italian football's already suffered the same. It's a matter of time before England suffers. It's big football, um, television deal crash. Matter of time. Um, Barcelona have leveraged the next 25 years of the Serie A TV earnings on a huge loan to spend more money on the next Frank de Jong's. It's, it's, it makes no sense. None of it adds up. Mental. It's self-economics that we're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually just spent 20 million quid on a Fucking SPL players in one season. Crazy. Steve, Steve, just before we move on, because I, I, I know you're, you're, you're wanting to hang me for, for, for time, but I, I, the one thing I would say about all these sort of super clubs, they, we'll, call them the, we'll call them the super league clubs. For, for a lot of these owners, it, it is, you know, I'm talking your PSGs, your Man Cities, even Man United um, and, and others, 
for a lot of these guys now, it's not about even winning trophies anymore. Man City don't really care if they don't win the Champions League anymore. Man United, the Glazers, don't really care if they never win a Premier League again. As long as they get back into the top four and they get the Champions League money and all the money that pours in for their Asian um, fan base as well. They've got massive following over there. PSG don't really care about winning the, the, the owners I'm talking about, not the coaches, but the, the owners, they don't really care about winning a Champions League. It's all about, can we sign the the, the, the yeah. old cowboy lacing up the boots for one last um, hurrah? Let's sign Leo Messi. or And, and, and it's just a circus now. And, and for as long as we can fight against that, I think we should. And it, like, like you say, it might take us a few, we might get a few um, drubbins in the Champions League on the back is standing your ground. But I'd, I'd rather get beat 7 nothing off PSG, but still be proud of my football club, than come and follow a, a circus act every two weeks um, with the chance of maybe making the quarterfinals every now and again. As I say, I think um, change for change's sake is never a good thing. I think as well, what adds up to that, <coughs> you put me a great point, is like, when you look at stadiums in the Premier League, they're filled by like tourists now, people just going along for an, yeah, an experience yeah. and the proper working class fans with priced out of tickets. Like Arsenal, some of their season tickets are over a grand. It's an absolute disgrace. And I do get what you're saying, 100%, but there has to be, as I said, a middle ground where Celtic can start spending more money too because unless we get a bit of capital or do something, we're just going to be further and further away from European competition. And I know you said about them drubbins, but sometimes them drubbins, I know PSC, Barcelona... I hear it because we know in the past in the past we could compete and score goals and win the odd game yeah, against them clubs too. So, so I mean, I do get what you're saying, and a lot of people, your your comment, James, about Seb Gonamic has made the night. Kieran saying it's class, and uh, Kaiser said it, it's the, it wins the night. Absolutely brilliant, man. It was it was a good one. Football, ninety sixty seven. Football is a business that day. Yeah, says yeah. it all. Charles Smith, it's built on sand. The sky pulled out. They all fall. I totally agree. That's a great point. That's I think what you were saying, James. If the Financial crash. The TV channels will go. They'll be the first to to fall on that one. And it's it's mad. I mean, the comments did go mad there. And Kevin Fourteen sums up Sky Sports killed football in general for yeah. the the clubs over here too. But we'll move on to uh, the Norwich game just briefly. Anthony, I know again it's pre season, but we'll go for it anyway to the end the show. Score and lineup prediction. Right. Well, I'm I'm not actually going to um, make the game tomorrow because. Um, it's my brothers um, and my sister, but my, my brother and sister have got their, their birthdays very close together. So we're having a big party uh, tomorrow uh, at his house. So um, I'm charged with getting all the music and that sorted for the morning. So that's my <laughs> task for the night. Uh, so looking forward to that. So Franco, uh, one of the regular contributors on the show, uh, is taking his dad along uh, tomorrow. So I hope you have a great time uh, in, in the seats Um as I say, I think, like you say, it's going to be kind of pre-season-ish sort of feel to it, Stephen. But I'm I'm hopeful that we'd be to see the new guys uh, in action uh, at some point. As I say, Norwich, I'll say 4-2 Celtic. I think we'll end with a win. But uh, I think the, the starting lineup will probably still be Joe Hart. In fact, no, I think Joe Hart and uh, his wife have just had another baby. So I think he might start with Seagrist. We'll, we'll go with that. We'll say Seagrist. Uh, I think Juranovic, Bernabe. We'll say Jens and CCB. Why not? Give the boy a home debut. And uh, do you know what? I'm going to I'm going to make you really happy, Steve. I'm going to stick Moy in there, making his home debut as well. Uh, yeah. On the right, try to think. I think perhaps it could be could be Jamesy again on the right hand side. Um, and I think Jota on the left again with the. Uh, Going to see O'Reilly through the middle, uh, and then Kyogo as well. I think I've only, I think I've only ten players there. I think I have um, O'Reilly as well. Then, ah, that's a that's a good one. Four two, did you say? Yeah, I'll say four two. Aye. A, a yeah. high scoring end to the preseason <laughs> vendeavors. I know uh, Chris Sutton put up a post saying he's looking forward to it, so no doubt he'll be at the game, James. And a few people have seen you point out their comments saying about Pookie coming back would be good. And Ryan Taylor said he's odds on here for a hat trick. But I mean, Pookie was an odd one, just didn't work out for him. He went to the Danish League game for Bromby, smashed it, and went to Norris yeah. and been their top goal scorer for the last like 90 seasons by all accounts. But where are you sitting on it, line up the score prediction? Christ, um, oh, well, the guy stole my thunder a wee bit because um, 
this, I mean, this could be one of the crazy days. I mean, you got a Kyogo hat trick in the first half, a Jackie Marcus hat trick in the second half, and the Pookie hat trick sale at the club. I never thought I would fucking see all in one go. <laughs> <laughs> A three one I think would be a, a reasonable result, but you just you don't know. The way the Celtic team plays right now and with the changes that we know we're gonna get at half time and all that, it could be anything. We could run up a cricket store a cricket score and, and still concede four goals. I mean it's, <laughs> it's the way it goes right now. Aye, hundred percent. If it, as long as it's a good game for everyone to enjoy back at paradise. I mean I'll go for Sigrist Ralston to start, I'll go CCV, I'll put Jansen. I think Anthony makes a great shout there. I put Taylor in. I'll go with Kalmak, O'Reilly, Hatate, Yakimakis to start because he's missed the last two pre-season, preseason games for the birth of his uh, baby. And I'll go Med on the left and Jad on the right. And obviously, I'll be switched again in the second half. And that's what we can see in about fifty goals. But sure. And then I'll go five. I'll go. I'll go five two. I can feel a, a high scoring game. I'll go five two to Celtic. And again, can I just thank everyone who's watched along at the minute? We're sitting. At 67 live, which is absolutely fantastic. We appreciate it. Oh, what, Craig a number. White, what a number. Craig White, the legend, our new member of the podcast night. And anyone wants to take a fan to that, it's 99 p.m. month. Get a wee nice emoji beside your name that John sort out for you. It's just great, Craig, and great for everyone involved in the channel as well. And do you guys, have you enjoyed this one? I have, mate. Yep. I uh, always enjoy being on with your good self, Stephen. And uh, as always, it's great to have James P. Uh, back on. Uh, it's been too long, my pal. Um, but yeah, and I think I'm um, think due to the schedule, I think I'm back in again myself and you on Monday night, Stephen. Am I right? Um, yes, you're can't hosting. Remember who else. Is it Ross is on as well? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. The Holy Trinity is back on Monday <laughs> night. So uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Um, hopefully, my hangover for Saturday will ju- have just about cleared by then. Because uh, when us siblings get together, but uh, it's a bit mental. But uh, yeah, looking forward to it. And as Kaiser says here at the end of the show tonight, Sev Sev Konomics, as James said, comment on the night. Absolutely fantastic. And everyone watching on, we'll be back again on Monday, looking back at Norwich's game. And if there's any transfer to things, we'll obviously talk about that as well. So stay well and keep safe. Hail, hail. Hail, hail.